I think it has the potential for making uh, terrible writers because, um, and again, I'm, I'm only really talking about episodic television, uh, um, uh, because you have to do the same thing week after week after week after week and year after year after year after year, um, the tendency is for you to, to stop trying and challenging yourself. Uh, that's why the shows that I do, I mean, we were doing Homicide. Uh, we tried to make a new little movie every week. We, we tried to approach the characters and the material in a fresh way every week because none of us wanted to write the same thing over and over again. And I, I'm a huge fan of Law and Orders, but I couldn't write that show because I, it's the rhythm of it is exactly the same every week. And, and I don't know how to do that. I start to always color outside the lines, you know. I just start to go, well, where, 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 put that over here, you know. Um, so I think, you know, we used to joke on St. Elsewhere because St. Elsewhere was a medical show, and you have to have at least once a week, you have to have a scene where the patient is in the bed and the doctor comes in and he says, this is what you've got and you're going to live, or this is what you've got and you're going to die. Okay, that's, that's the scene. You have to have that scene every episode. And the blocking is pretty dull. The patient's in the bed, and the doctor can go like that, can go, kind of go over here and walk around. But that's, it's a pretty dull scene. And if you've written it 130 times, you really are bored with it. And sometimes you have to do it two times an episode. So on St. Elsewhere, we started to add things like killer bees. and I mean, we would just try to come up with any re anything to go on in the room that would, that would make the scene different from just... This is what you got, and you're going to live. This is what you got, and you're going to die. So uh, uh, television encourages, um, <laughs> uh, you know, familiarity. People people like television shows that are the same every week. I mean, it, it's as much the audience's fault as the writer's fault because we want the same thing every week. But, you know, I, it's not good for writers. My only goal is to make... Uh, the audience ask questions. I'm, I'm not, my goal is not to preach to them. My goal is not to, uh, uh, you know, pretend like I have answers. Uh, what I write are basically questions. And, uh, and if somebody watches a show that I've done and they turn off the TV and they turn to their wife or husband and say, well, I, I think, I think this. And the wife or husband says, no, I think this. And they get into a conversation about it. Then I would I will I will have done my job, you know. What you don't want is people turn off the TV and go, you know, you want to go get a burger? Yeah, let's go. You know, <laughs> you know, where it just has no impact whatsoever. You know, I want to stimulate discussion because I think that's the that's what being the joy of being in a democracy is all about is we get to have conversations that other people in other under other governments don't. So. Um, I would say that, uh, I don't know. I would say, honestly, I don't know. Especially the older I get, because television is a young man's game, and I am now of an age, I am past the prime demographic, uh, uh you know, there's that 18 to 49 year old thing, well, I'm way past 49, and, um, and, you know, they, they tend to like, um, you know, the young guys to come in and, and write for for young people. I mean, you know, it's easier for a 30-year-old person to write for 30-year-olds than it is for a 56-year-old man to write for 30 years old. But I don't know. I, I, I don't have an answer. I'm just glad that I still am working, and, and I'm going to keep doing it until they hit me with a shovel. So. It, it was it was this idea that I want to keep challenging myself. I want to I want to um, start to uh, you know do other things. And uh, I've uh, I've written other things. Uh, you know, uh, I wrote uh, three pilots for about firefighters. Uh, this was before September 11th. <coughs> Sorry, and because I really think that's a world that's fascinating. Um, uh, you know, not, 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 none of the three got, uh, went to series. So um, I just think there's a lot of different places 
a lot of great stories out there. It isn't that, I, that I'm focusing on crime. I just homicide now is back to back with crime. But I don't, I, if I never did another crime show again. I think that it's easier to be afraid than to be courageous. And so we, uh, and right now, because it's such a confusing time, there's so much confusing us that it's, 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 it's simpler to be afraid and to try to uh, protect ourselves. Whereas I really believe the opposite. We should be, we should believe in ourselves and we should be not protecting ourselves. We sh I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't protect ourselves from attack, but I'm saying not become isolationist and kind of, you know, shut the borders and, and don't trust any other people from any other countries or any other cultures or, you know, that I think's the, I think that's the worst solution to the problem that we face. The writer is, is the primary creative force. In features, it's the director. And so that's number one. And because, because of that, so, a lot of writers are, are the producers. And so I get to make a lot of decisions that normally the writer is left out of. Um, I will also say that I, uh, I love the fact that I can write something, we can shoot it, and you know, 12 million people will see it in uh, you know, six weeks later. Whereas features, you know, they, they work on them and they work on them and they work. They seem never to be done, movies. I don't know. But, but I, could, I could write about something that's bothering me and within, you know, like I said, six weeks, it'll be on the air. And that's pretty, that's pretty exciting for a writer to have that kind of uh, uh, venue, you know. I think that, you know, I think a, I, I think a, a, a good writer is always kind of um, looking, you know, at the people around the table going, oh, there's a character, there's a character, I got that, I got that. Um, so, it, but you don't, you don't, I rarely take a whole person that I've met and put them on the page. I take a little here and a little there and a little there and I kind of mix it up depending on what, what the story uh, is is asking for so, um, uh, so the answer would be yes. I uh, it it comes from people I know, but it then it goes through my imagination. In terms of my writing, I can't say that anyone other than Chekhov and Shakespeare uh, influenced me. I mean, it wasn't like a it wasn't like I had a writing teacher when I was a, when I was a teen was much later that I had in college that I really started to kind of, you know, uh, but I will say I had a, I had a, uh, a swim coach in high school who, uh, who really influenced me because he uh, taught me uh, how not to be afraid, which I think was a much greater gift than teaching me how to be a writer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because uh, he taught me that the water was something, I was terrified to swim. And he taught me that the water was not in any way my enemy, but it was actually something quite wonderful. And I've been a swimmer ever since. So, um, you know, I think that the hardest thing about uh, living in a post-September 11th world is not being afraid. And, uh, uh, and you have to, again, go back to, I sound religious, but I'm really not. Uh, <laughs> but you have to believe in something. And, and, and you can't, uh, Dick Gregory, who's a wonderful uh, comic from the 60s, uh, I was at an event that he, he was at uh, right after September 11th, and he said, God and fear do not belong in the same sentence. And I thought that was a pretty extraordinary statement. Um, because, you know, to be afraid is to not live, is in my opinion. Um, I would say, uh, let me give you a negative answer to that, uh, as opposed to the positive and actually give you a list. I would say that uh, it's very easy for people to be influenced by uh, famous people in the media. Um, and I think that's very dangerous because 
uh, to get consumed or to be interested in, in, in the really sad life of like Lindsay Lohan or Britney Spears or any of those, it, that, to me that's like, I mean, just watching it from afar, it's, it's, like, it's like just wrong. I, th I, wish, I wish, you know, uh, I wish the media was better at representing positive role models as opposed to any time there's a scandal or any kind of like stuff that you know they think is sensationalism and you know I, 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 I'm I, 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 I watch a lot of news and I'm always so irritated by the news when you know the death of Anna Nicole Smith gets more uh, time in the course of a week than uh, than starving children in, in Africa I, to me I, I that is just, it's just wrong, you know. I, 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 having now just said that, I am popping into my head, starving children in Africa, I'm thinking about people like Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and George Clooney, who I think are doing the most extraordinary thing, which is taking their celebrity, you know, and, and helping people. Uh, so those would be people that I would say um, uh, are, are worth at least looking at what they're doing. I mean, you know, Brad Pitt down in New Orleans, helping to build houses, that's pretty good that's a pretty good role model because the people in New Orleans need help. Um, with politicians it's tougher. I can't really say <laughs> right now, though I guess Barack Obama, uh, and I still like Hillary, though I would I'm uh, I'm gonna vote for Barack, obviously I already have voted in the primary for Barack. But um, but uh, it's hard with politicians. They have to they have to they have to sell their souls a lot more than any of the rest of us do. So. Well, uh, I would say that uh, the best way to start to write is to write about things that you know something about. I know when I started writing when I was uh, a teenager, I started writing when I was very, very young. And uh, I made up a lot of stuff. Uh, and I didn't know very much. And um, I wrote this um, novel when I was, I don't know, 14 or 13. And I, and I wrote it on a notebook and I passed it all around to all my neighbors and everybody thought it was the funniest novel they'd ever read. And of course I hadn't intended it to be funny. I thought it was a searing uh, drama, but it's because I didn't know what I was writing about. So uh, after that, and I'm not saying you have to write about being a teenager. What I'm saying is you have to, you can write about being a king, but you have to write about your experiences up to that point in your life. And as you get older and you expose to more uh, uh, things that happen in life, then, then you can, you know, go further along. But it's, uh, I think it's really important to... Um, to write about the things that are important to you and write about the things that upset you and write about the things that confuse you and write about the things that inspire you. I have upstairs in my, in my house, I have a little writing room that I built on the roof. Uh, and that's, you know, it's like I've created the perfect environment. Um, I can pretty much write anywhere. Uh, uh, because I think what happens when you really are into the writing, everything else shuts. You don't hear anything. You don't see anything. You know. So, uh, I mean, I've never tried to write in Grand Central Station, but I'm willing to bet I could, because uh, you go into the zone and you just stay in the zone and you miss your train, and that's the way it is. You know. I have been. For about 30 years, I have been writing. I get up every day at 5.30, and I start writing immediately. I don't make the food, and I don't. I, I get up out of the bed, and I go sit down, and I start writing. Now, how long I write depends on what I'm working on that particular day. It could be a half hour. It could be I've worked 12 hours. You know, um, but I really think being a writer is not diff is not any different than being an, uh, an athlete. In the sense of not only do you have to to kind of exercise your mind every day, but you also have to do it at the same time every day. So your your whole creative process is is there for you 
the, you know, whether you do it at 5.30 in the morning or whether you do it at 10 o'clock or night, if you do it at the same time every day, if you can, if you can do that, then I think it, it, it's already there when you sit down, you know. And I do this thing, which, which works sometimes, not, not always, where the, just before I go to bed at night, the last thing I do is I look at the scene I'm going to write the next morning. And I just look at it. I don't, I don't like, you know, do too much. But I just go, oh, yeah, after I've got to write the scene with the grandmother and the giraffe. Yeah, i got to do that tomorrow. That's what i got to do. And then I go to bed. And a lot of times, like I said, not every time, but a lot of times that will be the last dream I have waking up will be the giraffe and the grandmother. And so that's what makes it so much easier to go and sit down and just start writing. So I mean, I know other writers who they have to vacuum and they have to, you know, paint the, paint the house and they, you know, because they, most writers avoid writing. And uh, to me, I feel so blessed that I get to do it every day that I don't, I don't want to lose a minute of it. Uh, you know, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, and I hate to vacuum also, so I, I wouldn't do it. I always start with characters because I think strong characters are really what people want to see. And plots are pretty much, we all kind of know, we can guess what, how the story is going to go most of the time, you know. But I think really interesting characters are what, are what, uh, keep us, especially in episodic television, keep us coming back week after week after week. And um, I have this little method um, where I, I, when I'm starting with a character, I start with uh, how his mind works, uh, how his heart works, and how his soul works. And um, the mind is, is what's his education, his or her education, what's... Uh, how does he or she reason through a, a problem? Um, those kind of elements that you, where you think about um, how we use our, our brains. And then the heart is, who does this, who does this character love? Uh, who would this character fall in love with? Who would this character, who's, you know, have a father, a mother, a brother, a sister? Uh, and then the soul part is about what does this character want out of life? And what does this character hope for? And what does this character believe? And I don't mean just uh, religious belief. I mean just what do they, uh, you know, how do they uh, perceive the world, you know? And what, and then that, how does that make them behave well or behave badly? Because they have, either they have a moral base or they don't have a moral base, but you have to make those decisions and not that everything comes out in the scripture writing. You know, you may say, oh, he's got a, a sister who he, he really deeply cares about, but the sister may not, not ever appear in any, of the, in any of the stuff, but you just need to kind of have it in your head, if you know what I mean. Well, it depends on the project. If I'm writing, uh, like, um, for example, uh, Homicide, Life on the Street, the show I did for NBC, there was a book that David Simon had written, a nonfiction book called a Homicide a Year on the Killing Streets, which we used as the basis. But I spent uh, a couple of months with the Homicide Unit in Baltimore. And, uh, but, that, but that show, we had a deadline. I mean, we were starting production, so I had to start. Um, uh, I mean, I had to stop the research and start writing. Um, I just finished writing my, my second novel, I guess, since the first one I wrote when I was 13, uh, which, I, which uh, uh, HarperCollins is doing. And it takes place in the ninth century in Rome. Now, I virtually knew nothing about the ninth century in Rome. Now I know everything you could possibly know. And, and, and the research, I did a lot of research beforehand, but I continually did research while I was uh, writing the novel. So I don't think you ever stop researching. And, uh, you know, because you're always thinking, oh, there's got to be another piece of the puzzle here that I can use. Well, I mean, it is true that I try not to 
uh, repeat myself. Uh, when I finished St. Elsewhere, everybody wanted me to do another medical show, and I was like, no, I just did 137 episodes of a medical show. I don't want to do that again. How many gurneys can you see, you know? I just like to remind you, in case you sometimes wonder why you're so... No, it's true, it's true. No, but it is true. I love to challenge myself. I yeah, love to. I love to not get lazy. But you know, but television is all about repeating yourself. You know, there's three Law and Orders. There's three CSIs. It's not. It's not like they're. That comes from me as opposed to them. I, so I, I don't really know why I'm. Why they still want to be in business with me. I know why I want still want to do it. You know. Well, that, that's really a collaboration between the, the writer and the actor. When you're, when you're initial, I like to write parts for specific actors because I've worked with them and so I already know the kinds of things they do. You know, most of the great plays uh, that were written uh, were written, the playwright was a part of an acting company. Uh, you know, Aeschylus and Moliere and Shakespeare um, we're all we're all parts. Of, they they knew the actors. Shakespeare would not have written Hamlet if he didn't know Richard Burbage, if he didn't know everything that Burbage did. You know, so I try to write for actors that I know. When you when I don't when I have a part that I'm writing where I don't know an actor, I, what I'll try to do is imagine somebody, some actor that I do know, uh, like I mean, uh, you know, like a famous actor, like you know, I'll go, oh, I'll write this as if. Catherine Hepburn was doing it, or Scarlett Johansson was doing it, even though I know she's not going to do it. At least I have some image in my head. But, but I'm telling you, the minute that you cast it, you start to give it over to the actor, and they start, you know, uh, they start coming up with things. And the, the better the actor, the more inventive they are. Uh, and that's what a lot of fun is to see, you know, to work with the actor and really come up with all those mannerisms and and rhythms, you know, we, we were doing, we, uh, the, one of the parts on Oz, um, uh, I had written as, as like a, you know, a homeboy, and this wonderful actor came in, and he read it, and he didn't read it very well, and I said to him, well, where are you from? I really thought he was interesting, and I said, where are you from? And he said, well, I'm originally from Nigeria, but I live, uh, I currently live in London, and I said, oh, well, could you do it same scene, but do it Nigerian. Do it with, you know, as if you were home in Nigeria. And he did it, and I and the scene was so much better than what I had written, because I just wrote kind of an obvious scene, and by him being uh, Nigerian, it suddenly had all this other stuff going on. And so I cast him, and uh, it was uh, the actor, uh, Adewale, who played Adebisi. And then he talked about coming up with stuff. He came up with the hat, you know, that he had this little hat that he wore. He just said, I'm going to wear this hat. And I was like, oh, that's great. I had no idea. <laughs> sure, wear a hat. I don't care. And he, and he kept it on his head. And it, well, what he did was he would shave his head, but he would leave the area where the hat was just so it was like Velcro. <laughs> and people would go like, how does he keep the hat on his head? And that became like the big, like the big thing. You know, nobody cared about the show. They only cared about Ottawali's hat, you know. Well, I, I try not to get too uh, married to the images in my head about what the actor should look like because I really like when an actor uh, comes in that I didn't expect. Um, uh, for example, uh, on Homicide, Yafet Kodo, who played the lieutenant of the Homicide Unit, uh, the character's name was uh, Al Girardello, and he was written as an Italian guy. And... Uh, and Yafid came in and we went, you know, Barry Levinson and I went, well, that's pretty great. And we'll have an Italian guy who, because in, in Baltimore, the Italian community and the black community are literally divided by a street. And we thought, well, great, he's, he's both, you know. And I would have never in my head when we were writing the show initially ever thought of Yafid Koto in the part. But the minute he started saying the lines... That was his part, you know. So I think it's I think it's important not to get too stuck on the, what's in your head and just uh, let the let the actor surprise you. Yeah. Well, I'm going to make a very dangerous statement, which is I've never had writer's block. I'm knocking on wood because I'm hoping never to have it. Uh, 
I don't know. I don't know what the, um, other than the, what I said before was if you do it every day and at the same time every day, your, your brain and your heart will be there ready to go to work, you know. It's like you eat around the same time over the course of the day and, you know, you, you just want to be, you want to be available to the writing at the same time every day. And, 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 and I, I will give you one, one thing that I think if you write every day and you have nothing to write, you should still write. Whether you write your name a hundred times or write about, uh, describe a banana, you know what I mean? Just anything. If you write five minutes and you just get it down, you're, you're, at least you're doing something. You know, it may not be what you want to be writing, but at least you get it, you get something down and you can stop and go, all right, I got that down. You know? Well, that's a, uh, that's a dangerous question. I am, a, I, I'm a kind of person, I like to think that I'm a collaborative person. And I think most people who work with me would, would, would agree. I think what's important for a writer in film or television is to really know what is important in the script that they really, really, really need to maintain and what, what you can kind of compromise and trade off. Um, I, I, you know, I come, uh, I come from the theater and in the theater it's a very collaborative effort. And, you know, the writers spend so much time by themselves in the little room writing and then all of a sudden you're in a room with a lot of people and there's cameras and there's actors and there's makeup people and directors and so it's easy to kind of go oh I'm losing I'm losing ground here I'm losing control of of this material and that's why you have to go in to that with a collaborative sense of collaboration as opposed to a sense of, of defensiveness or self-protection you know because I, I, I don't direct, I, I, I really love having a director's input because it's like when you've worked on something for so long, it's like having an editor, you want somebody to come in and go, well, have you thought about this or move this up here or why is she saying that or, you know, you need that other point of view. And then, and then when you add the actors, obviously they have to invest themselves in the character so deeply that and when you're doing episodic television uh, over, you know, if you're doing a series over five years or six years, well, the actors know the character better than you do by that point because they live with it every day, and, you know, and they've had to, you know, put that skin on every day before the camera. And so you have to respect that. Um, so I think being a writer in, in film and television is you have to have an ego, but you also have to have a... Uh, you know, roll with the punches. I think uh, my biggest weakness is probably television's biggest weakness, which is to be very obvious and very on the nose. Uh, you have a limited amount of time and you want people to say, you want to make sure the audience gets what you're writing, what, you, what your theme is or what your point is. And what happens is, is because there's this limited amount of time, there's a, there, and also you're banging the scripts out week after week after week, it becomes like a, you know, a factory of, of dialogue. The, the impulse is to go, oh, I'll just write it, just have the person say it. But that's not necessarily the best kind of writing because what most of us say and what most of us, uh, you know, when you're in a, dramatic situation, what most of us say in a dramatic situation and what most of us feel is usually not exactly the same thing. People are a lot less uh, self-aware in real life than they are on television. You know, <laughs> television, everybody seems to know everything about themselves and everybody else. And so it becomes kind of obvious and on the nose. And, and I fall into that trap. So I have to, I have to constantly fight that impulse. You know, when you're midway through writing 27 episodes and you're really tired and it's Christmas is coming and you want to go buy presents for your family you go ah, I'll just write that thing and we'll shoot it and it'll be fine but you have to fight that no absolutely not writing cannot be taught it, it all all um, 
all I can do is try to uh, guide people in ways to open up their own hearts and their own minds and their own souls to get in touch with the storyteller that we each possess within us. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, uh, I don't think you can teach writing. I think you can, you can stimulate writing, but I don't think you can teach it. And, um, and sometimes you don't, you don't, it's not, it's not, you know, sometimes I teach classes that are about great writers and how, and their process, as opposed to just writing, teaching a writing course. So I think there's a lot of ways to guide people uh, to become writers. Well, you know, uh, with the, with the uh, coming of the internet, uh, I have had to uh, deal more. I used to get, used to get, you know, like a, like in the old movies, you'd get like a bag of mail, and there'd be fan letters in there, and some would be angry and some would be not. And you'd write them back and all that stuff. Now, you know, it's like five minutes after the show's over, people are going, "That was the worst show I've ever seen in my life." And you go, "Like, gee, give me a second, let it breathe," you know, you know. So I, 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 I tend now to ignore everybody, the critics and the bloggers and the everybody. And what I, what I try to do is have a couple of people around me that I really trust their opinion, who aren't going to lie to me. And if they say to me, Tom, that was terrible, then it's pretty much I know it's terrible, you know, because they wouldn't, they, they love me and they want the best for me. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't tell me it was terrible to, to hurt me. They would tell me it was terrible because they they know I want them to be honest with me. But everybody else, it's like, eh, whatever. You know, you can't make everybody happy, so you really just got to write as honestly as possible and then take your lumps. I, you know, I went to see, when I was a kid, uh, I went to see, my parents took us to see uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland at the Studio Arena Theater in Buffalo, New York, where I was born. And... Uh, I went home that night and I started writing dialogue and I had no idea what I was doing and I haven't stopped writing dialogue since. So it wasn't like I made a conscious choice to be a writer. It was just what I started to do, uh, you know, uh, in the same way that I guess, you know, somebody else starts playing baseball when they're a kid. I just started writing. Uh, I do know, uh, you know, I, co I come from very... Uh, basic, honest, good people, uh, not artsy people, not involved in the arts at all. And when I said to my father, uh, after I got out of college, I said, I'm going to go to New York and be a playwright. He said, what's a playwright? Mm -hmm. So it gives you an idea of, <laughs> of how little information my parents had, but they were incredibly generous to me while I was starving in New York. And, uh, and, uh, uh I owe them everything that I have, uh, uh, but it was a, it was a, you know, because when I explained what a playwright was, my father said, "Wait a minute, people get paid to do that?" You know, he was a, he was a beer salesman. He 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 didn't really get the whole like you write every. I don't understand. You know, so. Anyway, it was uh, it was a kind of a, a, a Batman and Robin thing. Uh, it was very Batman and Robin-y. It was I, I sort of. Because I read a lot of comic books at the time, and uh, and I kind of just basically stole everything I could from uh, from uh, DC Comics. You know, I added my own little flourishes. But if you knew anything about Batman, you'd go, "Wait, this I read this <laughs> last month in DC Comics." My big break was Bruce Paltrow, who was uh, who's since passed away, and the father of Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, and the husband of Blythe Banner um, uh, uh, came to see a play that I wrote. Actually, he didn't come to see the play. Blythe and Gwyneth and Jake came to see the play that I wrote. And they said to Bruce, you should go see Tom's play. And, and Bruce never went to see the play. It was running all summer. It was up at the Williamstown Theater Festival in Massachusetts. And Bruce uh, was running in repertory, so he had a lot of chances to see it, but he never went to see it. And at the end of the summer, he said, oh, you know, Blythe is, Blythe is pissed off at me that I didn't go see your stupid play. And, 
And he goes, and so I'm, I'm doing this new medical thing, and I'm just going to give you a script to write. And I'm convinced to this day, if he had seen the play, he would have never hired me. <laughs> so I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cautionary tale about being too aggressive. Uh, because, it, you know, if I was like, oh, I gotta work, I gotta work on television, I gotta, uh, uh, I would have probably forced him to come, you know, gotten Blythe to force him to come, and he would have sat there going, this is terrible, and, and it was terrible, the play was terrible. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that was my big break. My big break came really by accident, and accidents are really important in show business. You know, talent is important, accidents also important. Well, I'll tell you, the, uh, up until I won the Emmy, the previous award I'd ever won was Happiest Camper. <laughs> so it was a long gulf between <laughs> awards. And uh, I was absolutely thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled. I only later really came to realize that the awards, as nice as they are to have uh, in your house, uh, really are meaningless uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but if you put the, your self-identity and if you put the value of yourself and your work on the trophies uh, or on making a big deal, you know, a big money deal in Hollywood, then, then, you, then you, give it, you give it away, as, you give the power you have uh, in here away to other people who really don't, really don't care about your 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 work. I mean, they only want to use your work, but they don't. They don't. They're not going to nurture it the way you would. So I think, I think winning tr winning awards is really nice, and I wouldn't give any of them back. But on the other hand, uh, you know, if the if my house burned down, I wouldn't be weeping over the. I'd be weeping over a lot of stuff, but not my awards. Um, in terms of the doors it opened for me, it didn't really open any doors because I won for. St. Elsewhere, and I already had the job, and and I kept having the job. So, um, other than looking good on my bio, it doesn't. It it never really, you know. The one thing I will say that I am proud of is that I have won. I'm one of only three people who've won uh, the writing award for drama, uh, the Emmy. For, uh, uh, the other two are David Milch and Rod Serling. And I consider myself very privileged to be in that little club of, of people who've won the most uh, writing awards for drama series. If I had the opportunity, I would go back and rewrite every single thing I've ever written. And I'm serious about that. I, I cannot watch anything that I've written at, at all. I hate everything that I've written. I mean, I, I, I don't hate it in the sense of I, I feel like, wow, I could do it better now. I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a strange experience uh, because, you know, I'll be flicking the channels and Homicide will be on, you know, uh, uh, what's it on, uh, Sleuth, and I'll go, oh, there's that episode, oh, oh, oh this scene <laughs> stinks, oh my God, oh, and I want to like get everybody back, come on, let's all come back and we'll do it again because I know how to make it work this time. I would, I would literally burn every piece of film and start all over again. If I were given, given the chance, uh, I would start all over again because it always could be better and, and uh, so throw it all away. Well, just recently uh, I was going to be doing a series for NBC called The Philanthropist and um, just about two weeks ago uh, I got fired. And I got fired because I wanted to make a show that was about uh, uh, what's wrong with the world and, and what, we're, what we should be doing to try to help fix it. And the head of NBC uh, had a different vision. He wanted much more escapist, kind of 18 Fantasy Islandy kind of a show. And we kept butting heads. And um, uh, about two weeks ago, they said, you know what? Take a walk, and I took a walk. Uh, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm disappointed. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, crushed by it because I do feel like I was being true to the vision that I had. 
and I ultimately think that's more important. You know, there's a, there's a quote in the Bible, and I'm not a particularly religious person. I don't even know where this quote is in the Bible, but it says we are, we are not called to be successful. We are called to be faithful, and I really do believe that. I think each of us has to. Success is such an unimportant and, you know, kind of just disappears. In a, it comes and goes, and there's no way to hold it. Whereas if you're faithful to whatever it is, you, you know, whatever you believe, then I think that's, that's what we should do. So I don't know if I've answered the question, but uh, maybe I've successfully avoided answering the question, which <laughs> is the sign of a successful and faithful person. Well, I've wanted to write, I wanted to do a series about... Uh, this is going to sound weird. Uh, the Vatican. I was thinking about this after prayer. Yeah, yeah. Because I feel the presence. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, am like, I, I like to call myself a, 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 a half-assed Catholic is what I call myself, because I am still Catholic, but I'm, I, I have so many arguments with, the, with the Church, but I think the Vatican, the politics of the Vatican, but also. The whole idea of faith and lack of faith is something that I really think at this point it would be great for us to explore, you know. No, 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 no. Uh, but that would be the thing that I would, I would like to do right now. Uh, I did write, just finished writing this novel, uh, which I refer to as my first and last novel because it's too hard. It's really very hard to write a novel. The, uh, coming out of a lifetime of writing dialogue and being used to having actors and musical scores and <laughs> all that stuff that helps make the story work, when you're writing a novel, you're all by yourself and you're sitting there going, oh my God, I actually have to describe all of this <laughs> and, I have to, and there's not going to be an actor who's going to make this line uh, of work. It's got to work just on its own, you know, this, this piece of dialogue. And there's no score coming up underneath to, to kind of move the reader into the play. You know. So you're really on your own. And it's, uh, it's hard. It's hard. And uh, um, I, am, uh, I am writing, uh, go back to the Batman days, I am writing a graphic novel uh, for DC, which I find incredibly ironic that I am going back to where I started <laughs> at age nine. Um, uh, and that's fun because, again, it's something I don't have a clue how to do. And, uh, and they're kind of guiding me along uh, in that. And it's, uh, it's very exciting. And I'm also writing uh, something for the Internet, uh, a, a, but it's more of a series for the Internet, which I also find fascinating. The, the, the things that the demands of the Internet, but also the benefits of working in the Internet. Well, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, any institution that is supposed to be uh, making life better for the rest of us, that fails at it, uh, we should be examining. And um, uh, so, you know, my big problem with the penal system is that, is that we are lousy at dealing with criminal behavior. We, we stink at it. And so if, if uh, you know, on the other hand, Oz is not meant to be a polemic about uh, prison reform, but what it is to say is, you know, why are we let these, why, does, why do we let this environment exist uh, as opposed to really trying to figure out how to help people reunite them with their families and, and, and make them better citizens as opposed to worse, you know, but worse citizens with better muscles. Uh, that's what we tend to produce uh, from our prison system. Yeah. Well, both and, and neither. What it is is that when you're doing an episodic drama series, what you need to do is, in order to have your characters, have the audience uh, listen to your characters, you have to, you have to know that they are in jeopardy in other words, if I was doing a show about a war and we were in here having this conversation uh, and I walked outside and got blown up, 
you'd go, oh man, what Tom said before he got blown up, that's, that's really important. Whereas if we were doing a show about dog catchers, you know, uh, you'd go, oh, I went out and then I caught a dog. You'd go, eh, it's not that big a deal, what Tom said. So, so I, I just think it's important for, if you're gonna do a drama series, for it to be rooted in a kind of life and death, the urgency of life and death, uh, because then it gives the characters weight that, um, you know, you, you look at a show, and, and I'm not making a judgment about it, but, it, but you'd look at a show like uh, Desperate Housewives, you don't really care what they think or feel. You just kind of watch it and go, oh, that was fun, and, and you move on. You know, whereas if you're watching, um, you know, a show like uh, Law and Order, let's say, where, where they're really dealing with stuff, you kind of, you know, when Sam Watterson starts to talk, you go, ooh, that's really, that's really important, you know, so. Well, I'm going to tell you that I have never seen a reality television show, and I don't want you to think it's because uh, I have a problem with them. I don't. I just, it, it, I, they, the essence of them seems to be either making fun of the human condition, you know, putting people in opposition to each other for, for the worst reasons, uh, you know, eating worms and all that stuff. I don't I just don't, it just doesn't come into my, into my, I, I just don't have any interest in it. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I suppose a show like uh, whatever the one where they build, rebuilds people's houses, at least they're doing some, some good in the world, but uh, it, it just seems to reek of cheap sentimentality. So I, 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 you know, I hate when I'm asked to cry. I hate movies or TV shows that, that expect me to cry. So I never cry when they expect me to cry, and you, you know, they, the, you know, they arrive and the house is redone and the crippled children and the thing and they're all and the dogs jumping and I'm supposed to be <laughs> weeping and I'm just sitting there going, please stop it! It's all so manufactured, it's all so fake, it all, it's just all, I don't, know, I don't know. So that's my problem with reality television. It's not real. It's it's fake. It's fake television. It's worse than what I do. It's more made up than what I do. Exactly. You know. So, you know, again, I, I wish I had an answer for that. I think there is uh, research that says yes and research that says no. Um, I had a meeting a while back with uh, Senator Brownback, um, who was emphatic that uh, violence in television was destroying teenage minds, and you know, um, and he may be right. I don't know. I think. Uh, it's a it's a really uh, big question, and it is a very it's the kind of thing that we have to protect two things. We have to protect uh, young minds, and we have to protect freedom of speech. And sometimes they are in conflict with each other. That's why I think parents and teachers are absolutely essential, because uh, they have to know what the people in their care, the young people in their care are being exposed to and help them not dictate choices, but help them make choices mm -hmm. and help them understand why that's the wrong choice, you know, uh, or, the, or it's the right choice, you know. Um, it's a really, really complex <coughs> question that I think, like, like, like all the important questions, whether it's death penalty or abortion or anything, there are so many elements and I think the danger comes when we just say it's it's black or it's white because it's 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 got to it goes back to what I was just saying about having discussions we have to we have to keep talking about these things as opposed to just you know dict dictate if you can do anything else do that <laughs> that would be my first uh, my first advice and then I would say you know you have to you have to write uh, what you really care about, what you really, what you, what really uh, defines you and defines the people around you, and and if you if you write well, uh, you know someone will pay attention to it. So it, you, it, you know some people, because we live in such a media age, uh, a lot of writers that I know, young writers that I know. Uh, 
you know, they want to write, uh, you know, they go see Iron Man and they want to write an Iron Man, you know, and, uh, and that's all well and good if that's what you want to do. If it's just commercial, if you just want to make a zillion dollars and uh, then that's fine. But, you know, to me, writing is, is that's not writing per se. That's just, you know, filling up space as opposed to tr really trying to write stuff that, that defines your generation. I think, um, I think we all have an obligation to define the times we live in. However, whether it's through comedy or drama or poetry or whatever, you know. So, you know, and, and after that, getting to be a professional writer is really, really hard. Uh, it, you know, getting an agent, uh, getting meetings with people, uh, getting publishers, all that stuff. It's just, uh, it really is hard. And you have to be, when I was young, uh, when, not when I was a teenager, but when I was about 20, a very successful uh, director said to me, you really shouldn't be a writer. You're not very good at it. And I was too stupid to listen to him. So my entire career is based on my stupidity uh, because any, anybody with a brain would have said, wow, this is a very important director. <laughs> and he would know. And, and so... And I didn't do like, I'll show him. I was just like, no, he's wrong. I'm a good writer or I can be a good writer, you know? I was just too dumb to, and I couldn't figure out what else I would do. So that's why I said at the beginning, if you can do anything else. Do uh, well, I, I would say write what you know uh, is the first. And I would say the second was uh, if, you, if you believe what they tell you in Hollywood. If, they if you believe, when they tell you in Hollywood that you're good, if you believe them when they tell you you're good, then you have to believe them when they tell you you're bad. And they will do both. There's nobody who gets through their entire careers without being told that they stink. So if, and it goes back to what I was saying before about whether you give them your power or whether you keep your power for yourself. And so that's the second best advice I got.